Hi, everyone. My name is Camille Burnett, and I'm here with Abigail Echohawk, and I'm thrilled to have her here. Abigail is the director of the Urban Indian Health Institute, and as well, she's the chief research officer at the Seattle Indian Health Board. So greetings from the land of the Coast Salish people in Seattle, Washington, where my office is located. I'm also an enrolled citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma on my father's side, but I was born and raised in the heart of Alaska amongst the upper Athabascan people in rural Alaska. So I have the incredible, unique opportunity to have been raised in a very rural community, native community, but to live and work in the thriving city of Seattle with an urban Indian people, which right now about 71% of all native people live off tribal lands in urban settings. And with that comes unique strengths and also unique challenges. And so I'm excited to share some of those with you today. And as I sit here on this land, I always remember that I follow in the footsteps of my grandmother, my great, great grandmother, my great, 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 great grandmother, all of those in my community who survived so that I could thrive today and that my children's children also thrive. Thank you so much for that. And you know, you, you've underscored a lot of key points that I think we're gonna get an opportunity to circle back around specifically around this thriving and flourishing and, and definitely having this spirit of generational resilience, right? In my role as the director of the Urban Indian Health Institute, I direct a tribal epidemiology center where we are working to ensure that there's representation through data, through evaluation and through research to policymakers and tribal leaders living in urban cities across the United States. So it is a huge variety of things and that's what public health is. It's looking at all of the impacts of everything around us from access to foods, to, act, to uh, the way that disease affects us like cardiovascular disease. And it uses the strengths and the knowledge that lie within my community to be able to um, fill those gaps and to use our knowledge systems to revitalize our culture and to also ensure the health and well-being of our people moving forward. And one of the big things that I just wanted to highlight from what you said was one, speaking about not just understanding culture, but having cultural humility to recognize that the, re the responses and the answers that we need lie within the, those communities. And those communities have very unique cultures, communities of color across the United States, each one of those have their stories and their experiences and their traditions to share. And so within that space, we also know that there's a lot of health disparities, right? That our communities in particular suffer from at disparate proportions than other communities. COVID-19, as a result of these built health disparities, has impacted my community in a way that keeps me up at night. I have known multiple people who have died of COVID-19. Many of my friends and family members have contracted COVID-19. And as a result of these built health disparities that are directly linked to colonization and the continued oppression of American Indian Alaska Native people, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, asthma, all of the risk factors that put you more at risk of complications and death as a result of COVID-19, they exist in my community in a disproportionate way. And so right now, every single day, I am battling to ensure that our people are given the opportunity to live. And we are recognizing that now is the time to make incredible changes to undo these health disparities because it shouldn't have taken a pandemic for people to finally realize that Native people were suffering in this oppression that exists within the United States. But now that we have some of that realization, now is the time to make those changes and to say these health disparities should not, and I refuse, they will not continue. You're absolutely right. COVID should not have been the wake up call for disparities that we know that have perpetuated for generation to generation to generation. And so when we think about that, what do you see as being at the root cause? Um, and so when we talk about institutional and structural racism and these structures that have been built to inhil inhibit the health and wellness of communities of color and for the Native community, this has been going on for more than 500 years. I have been fighting for access to data on the impact of COVID-19 and of the other health factors such as asthma, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and what that looks like for my community.
However, I can't get access to it. Um, as a tribal epidemiology center, I have legal authority um, under federal law to have access to data from the CDC. But for the longest time, the CDC refused to give it to me. And when they did give it to me, they only gave me a sliver. Um, and what they gave to me was almost meaningless. Because what we have found is that around COVID-19, and I've been shouting this from the rooftops for more than 15 years, is that nationally people aren't capturing race and ethnicity in the medical records in the way that they need to. So how is that a symptom of um, institutional structural racism? How is that perpetuating health disparities? Well, policymakers, states, counties, they make decisions on allocation of resources, interventions, and prevention for things like cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, and now COVID-19 based on data. If you do not have the data, then you simply don't exist. So what this is doing is that this continuous system that is eliminating us through the data is actually part of an active genocide that is happening against Native people. Our treaty rights are based on tribal members like myself. If you eliminate us in the data, you're actually eliminating the numbers of people who then have treaty rights, which means that you're actually helping out the federal government in eliminating their responsibilities to us. All of these things have long acting and um, power that has been going on since data systems were built. And data isn't the only example of that. We see that in the discrimination in healthcare where native people and other people of color are treated differently. They don't receive the same services. There, um, there's implicit bias and other things that impact the quality of care that they receive. You know, you know, Abigail, you just said that so well with so much passion and deep honesty, because those that's called speaking truth to power. And that needs to happen far more frequently than it does. And not about just talking about it, but being about it and doing something about it. And I think you've captured all of that. These systems have been built to marginalize and to push aside um, the impact that health disparities are having in our communities. And as a result of that, these systems, you know, they've been going on for, you know, in my situation, hundreds of years. Um, and all of the folks that I get to meet who work in data, for example, my question to them is, if we're not included in the data, then that means you are part of the system that is effectively eliminating my people. And that's a hard truth for them to sit in. And I encourage them to sit in that and recognize that when I walk away, you know, it'd be easy for them to forget it, but I can't. I don't have that privilege. I'm gonna fight for my people every single day and what I want is allies. I want accomplices. I want people who are gonna take this information and make change. I want them to challenge the practices that they've been a part of. Look at where they have been complicit. Well, you've got an ally right here. I can tell you that you've got a sister and an ally right here. And, um, you know, so much of what you just talked about just needs to be discussed over and over and over again to talk about these systems and these structures. And so in that work, you talk about not just what's wrong, but where can we go in terms of solution? And so some of the work that I look at, particularly is around creating structural justice. And how do we create justice within systems so that we're not bending the arc towards justice? It's inherently built within those systems and those structures that we create. And so along those lines of solutions, it, it leads us to start thinking about resilience and strength. And I know that's a big part of the work that you do. You really focus a lot on strengths and resilience um, as a more accurate way, so to speak, of really talking about the narratives that we often hear about our communities that are very disparaging and very centered around despair and hopelessness. I always think that my ancestors um, survived so that I could thrive. And they passed down these incredible teachings from generation to generation to generation. And one of them is, is that we take care of each other. We take care of our youth, we take care of our elders, and they are at the forefront of everything that we do as Native people in this country and um, that we take care of the community as a whole. That's what Western public health is trying to do now. And they could have come and learned from some native people um, because we have always done that. And our resiliency is built in that, that even despite our own circumstances, which may not be that great at that time, 
We give everything we have to ensure the well-being of that next generation. Right now in the midst of COVID, I see this happening across the nation in, in ways that haven't been as public before. There's an incredible guy in Minneapolis who began to make traditional foods meals, so meals that have the traditional foods of native people and feeding them to elders in Minneapolis. So what does that do for my community? First of all, they get a nice, warm, hot meal. They get their traditional foods, which are healthy. They present they prevent obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. It's the healthy, incredible food that our ancestors ate. In addition to that, it feeds the spiritual and cultural components. For us as Native people, our food and our connection to the land is also part of our spiritual practices and part of our cultural practices. So this young man in Minneapolis is feeding the mind, the body, the soul, and the spirit of these elders by feeding them these traditional foods. Um, we have these resiliencies that the rest of the country should be looking to, particularly in a pandemic, where we're having to evolve and to change. Well, you know, building in the peace with resiliency and action is so absolutely important. What things do you think that we can learn um, from your community and their practices, more specifically, as we're at this time where we're getting rid of the old, looking at new innovative ways and approaches, could you give us some suggestions that, that we could use in terms of how we rethink and we re-envision the approaches that we've been using to restoring health? But then in a really specific example, in this time of COVID, one of the things that has been a real struggle for folks is that as their relatives who have COVID have um, passed on in the hospitals, it's been a real struggle for people to not be by their sides. And when I think about the resilience in my community, in a perfect time, yes, we would be with our loved ones as they walk on into that next place. But as a Native person, I actually have peace in that. And that's because I know my connection to my land and to my ancestors. And the way that we were taught is that our ancestors are with us at all times. So even though we can't be physically in that room with that loved one who is passing on to that next place, I know their ancestors are there. I know that they're with them and that we, while we're on the outside, sing songs for them, while we pray for them. I know those ancestors carry those songs in their prayers to our loved ones. And that gives us peace. That connection is part of our resiliency. And that's something that other people can learn from. Because I know that I will continue to fight for my people every single day to ensure their health and well-being. And I am just one of many Native people doing that exact same thing. I will fight until my ancestors come and carry me home to the stars. That is the life that I get to live. And those are the lessons that you can learn from Indigenous communities as we look to restore health and wellness to our communities, where we change the systems of oppression, when we go back to those understandings that recognize we are never alone, our relatives are not alone, and instead we know that we are wrapped in love and community and always in the strength and the prayers of our ancestors. Abigail, thank you so much for that. You truly are a brilliant and gifted colleague, and I'm honored to call you now a, a friend. 